Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on success tips for the single agent. And we have our featuring a special guest today, Nina Hollander. My name is Shannon Shima Bakuro. I'm a senior market leader trainer, and I am so excited to welcome you all today. Now, you might be wondering, what kind of single agents are we talking about? And no, it is not the Beyonce kind of single. It is for those of you that are operating your business as a agent by yourself, <laughs> excuse me, running your own business. And I apologize, I do have a cough today, so I might have to mute randomly to cough. So first, we're going to meet Nina. We're going to talk about how to build and work a referral base as a single agent. Why focus on internet leads? <coughs> Excuse me. And how to optimize your day and do it all yourself. And then, of course, we'll leave time for questions. So we're lucky today that Nina's the main one getting to talk, not me. <laughs> so Nina, first of all, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy agent day to be here with us. Welcome. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Nina. And Nina, can you give us a little background on yourself? Um, tell us about where you live, what's the market like in your area, and how you got started in real estate. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm uh, by upbringing a New York City girl, and I spent 20 years in the corporate world and now 22 years in real estate. And I went into real estate about 22 years ago after we moved back to New York from overseas. And even though I was being very aggressively headhunted and recruited to go back into the corporate world as a uh, executive management finance person, I just decided I wanted to do something a bit more entrepreneurial. I wanted to have more options about who I worked with, when I worked with them, et cetera. I also came from a world where in New York City, when someone said, do you know a good real estate agent, people would respond, that's an oxymoron. And having had some experience with New York City real estate agents, I realized that I could run rings around them. And I really did. And within uh, two years of becoming uh, a broker in New York City, I was one of the top New York City brokers. So. Um, that's kind of my background. We moved to Charlotte about 16 years ago, ostensibly to retire, and you can see how well that's taken. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After about a year, my husband looked at me and insisted I go back to work. He said he didn't even care if I made any money, just get out of the house. So, um, <laughs> so I've been uh, back in the real estate field since we moved back to Charlotte. Our market right now is really pretty good. Um, we've had uh, a good couple of years with nice steady improvements. We've got a huge inventory shortage, which obviously has its own challenges. Um, and I don't know what else you'd like me to tell about myself. <laughs> well, but they're on the I think that's standpoint. Yeah, I think I think that's fantastic. I know your your numbers speak for yourself. We'll just let people read through your accolades. We won't bore them with that. But um, I think it's pretty impressive, Nina, that you're top 2% within your franchise, five-star best in client satisfaction, and that's something you worked really, really hard to earn. Can you tell us a little bit about your business makeup? It says on the screen 70% referrals, 30% internet. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Have you always had a really heavy referral base? Did you have a referral base when you moved to Charlotte, or did you have to start over? Well, um, I guess I've always had a good referral base, including in New York City, but I didn't have it because I specifically worked to have it. I, I had it because I provided really great service. Um, somewhere along the line, a light bulb went on in my head after I came to Charlotte um, to begin to understand how to work a referral database. So. Depending on the year, my referral business is anywhere from 65 to 75% of my business. And the good news about that kind of a data, uh, that kind of a business is that at the lowest point of the market in the last few years in Charlotte, that one year that was so low, 85% um, of my business came from repeat and referral clients. And I had a significant six-figure gross commission income that year. So that tells you just how important that uh, uh, referral base is, because there was not a lot of new business uh, coming in at that point uh, in terms of new buyers and new sellers. So that base is what kept me in business during the worst times uh, of the market. Um, about 30% of my 
I would say 90% of my business that's not referral and, and repeat business is generated by the internet. And then the other 10% is anything from uh, sign calls, expired marketing, um, et cetera. But I have focused on the internet business really since I started in Charlotte six, almost 15 uh, years ago now. Okay, well, let's go back a little bit. So, because a lot of us, when we move into a new area or as a new agent that just got licensed, we're starting from ground zero. Yeah. Right? So, in the beginning, and I'm not talking about dinosaur land, but kind of a joke of a slide. <laughs> but in the beginning, when you started out, how did you build that referral base? Well, you know, in the beginning, I got my license here in Charlotte, and I was, I was a very experienced broker. Um, in terms of understanding the business, in terms of knowing how to negotiate, in terms of knowing how to work with people. But I really knew very little about Charlotte. I mean, if you took me five miles away from my house, I'd probably get lost, you know. So, and one of the things I recognized very quickly as I entered the business was that we had thousands and thousands of agents in a relatively small market. And that, as I've always said, Charlotte needed another real estate agent like it needed a hole in the head, quite frankly. <laughs> and so I knew, and I knew about three people in Charlotte at that point. I mean, literally. Um, so I really had to start thinking about what I could bring to the table. And I'd like to say that this was absolute brilliance on my part, but it wasn't because I was learning a new way of doing business. I was learning about a new city. I was attending every bit of training I could. And about that time was when Realtor.com first started offering, uh, for not a lot of money, uh, agent websites. And who ever heard of websites at that point? You know, And some light bulb went off in my head that said, you know, since I don't bring much to the table, as a charlatan and as my, in terms of my knowledge of the city, I've got to go and maybe bring something to the table in terms of my knowledge of how to develop business on the internet, how to work with internet leads, you know, because I have to tell you, at that time I was a 50-year-old woman who'd never even pushed an on button on a computer. I had never sent an email in my entire life and quite frankly, one of my objectives in life was to go to my grave never having sent an email. And <laughs> I think we can all relate to that a little bit. <laughs> so uh, I really had to totally rethink what I was going to do as an agent. And I didn't do all that many sales um, my first year in business because I was really, really focused I'm learning about computers, learning about technology, learning about what was out there for real estate agents um, that was technology related. It was, it was really an interesting kind of exercise, and it feels so long ago. And then things just started rolling from there. You know, my first two clients, one was a referral from a headhunter who uh, whom I knew from our joint banking days back in the 1970s. Um, mm -hmm. And the other uh, first piece of business was a 24-year-old who came to me through my Realtor.com website. It was my first internet lead. And I sold him a house, and he referred his colleagues to me. And, you know, it just started rolling from, you know, from that standpoint. So, uh, but... Clearly, even though I didn't have a, date, uh, a real database at that time, a lot of my first clients were referrals to me by people I knew from elsewhere and who happened to have children in Charlotte or relatives in Charlotte. And, you know, from there, I just started making sure I was really on top of my client base. I hate to call any client a past client. I really think the minute you start referring to them as a past client or a former client, that's what they become in your head. And in my mind, they are clients forever, and they may not be buying or selling today, but they are a client. They are not a past client. Ah, I love that. I think that's a really smart way to think about it, and I think that's what, probably one of the reasons why you're so good at maintaining and keeping in touch with them. And we're going to learn more about that as the call goes on, but I think that's a really 
a critical distinction than a lot of, I think, just it's something that sets you apart in this. So I thought that was really excellent. Yeah. Now, one of the things that um, you you also you know mentioned to me in your, in, you know, in the beginning is you said you know I'm a woman that wanted to go to the gray without sending an email. Yet here I am, one of two of your first clients is an internet lead. How did you win that person over to becoming a future important referral base for yourself? Well, the interesting thing is internet leads back then were different from internet leads today. That's really important to understand. Back then, an internet lead was much more like I would call, uh, I would refer to as a sign call uh, uh, lead. Because we didn't have IDX, they would find you on the internet, and then they'd call you. You know, today they don't call you. All you have is an email address, and you have to start developing a relationship. All right. So I had this young fellow call me up and said, I found you on Realtor.com. And I could tell he was very young. And my, the first question out of my mouth at that point, because our kids were older than he was, it was, are you old enough to buy a house? And he laughed his head off. You know, <laughs> you know uh, I mean, I was older than his parents, for heaven's sakes. You know, but... Um, but, you know, he was a first-time buyer. as a young fellow. We met... And, you know, he didn't have a big budget, but we really made it happen for him. Um, and as I said, he referred one of his colleagues to me who bought at a higher price point. They referred more people to me. At the end of the day, to get someone to, to come back to you, either as a repeat client or as a referral client, you have to do two things. You've got to give them, you know, 10-star, world-class service. They always have to feel like you're their, they're your only client and nobody else in this world matters to you except them. And then mm -hmm. you, you have to stay in touch with them, stay in touch with them, stay in touch with them, and keep reminding them that you're there and you're open to referrals. Um, I think the NAR does studies all the time, and they keep saying that you know some huge percentage of people say they were satisfied with their agent and they would use their agent again, but when it came time to use their agent again, guess what? They couldn't find their agent. They didn't know where their agent was. They didn't know how to get in touch with their agent. Whose mm -hmm. fault is that? So less than 30% of people repeat their business with an agent they were satisfied with because they don't know how to get in touch with them. So I made right. it my life's mission to make sure they never <laughs> forgot about me, to make sure I was always top of mind awareness, and to keep touching them in a way that the minute the thought went through their head that they need to do something or they just heard from a friend who needs to do something, there's probably something on their desk or their table from me, and they go, oh, let's call Nina. Right. You know, and it works. Awesome. Well, so... And I see how that end result happens, obviously, from that fantastic 10-star customer service to the repeated touching. And we're going to get more into actually specific pieces that Nina touches her clients with, her current and existing clients with, not past clients. But Nina, what about those internet leads? You said when we, we've had our pre-interview, one of the things you said I thought was really interesting was your mindset in approaching leads. And you, and you started by saying in this call how Back in the day, internet leads were different than they are today. What's your yes. mindset now when you go into working with an internet lead today? Well, look, 15 years ago, as I said, it was more, you know, they'd find you on the internet, and, you know, websites were pretty static at that point. You couldn't do any home searches. You basically found someone, you read something about them, you picked up the phone and called them. Back then, the majority of my internet leads would pick up a phone and call me and tell me they found my they found my website or they would email me with their phone number so I could call them and because they couldn't information hadn't yet spread out the way it does now through Zillow and Trulia and what have you they really needed us just the way a non-internet lead did for information about houses so they typically would get hold of you anywhere three to six months before they were ready to do something. Um, a long-term lead was like a nine to 12-month lead. 
Today, I think they start at, at least at 12 months. They start playing on the internet, looking at houses. I convert a lot of people who I've been in contact with for two, three, four, even five years because the information is out there. They can hide behind the privacy of the internet in a way that they couldn't 15 years ago. So you, I really had to rethink how I dealt with them because I don't have phone numbers most of the time to call anybody and have a voice-to-voice -voice, uh, contact with. Right. Right. So when you approach approach a lead today, like, and you look at it, do you immediately rule them out as like just chalk them up to being bad leads, or, you know, or like, eh, this is another person that's not going to call me? I mean, what's your mindset when you go to approaching a lead, and what what have you found that's helped you to stick with it and be successful? Well, I think my philosophy is that there really isn't any such thing as a, as a bad lead. Uh, do I return the occasional lead to market leader? Sure, because it's a bad email, you know, bad contact information. That's a bad lead, obviously. But someone who's provided us with a good email address and or a good phone uh, number, um, they're just a lead that's not ready to transact yet. And we don't know what their timeline is. You know, I've had people mm -hmm. who've said they're just looking who are really ready to do something in three months. I've had people who said they were ready to do something in three to six months and it took them a year. So it's not a question that leads are bad. Leads are simply not ready. And so, again, you have to come in with the mindset. If you come in with the mindset that they're all bad, you will have, that's how you're going to react to them. You have to come in with a mindset that says, they're just a lead, and they're equal to any other lead, and I just have to put in a process whereby I'll stay on top of them. Now, that being said, I do a certain amount of uh, scrubbing of leads in the sense that, you know, frankly, if someone signed up and all they're looking at is $45,000 properties, they, they get a welcome letter, they're welcome to look on my website as much as they want to, but I'm not, I'm not doing a whole lot of work for a $45,000 lead because the time invested in it for me is just not worth it versus what I'll earn on it. But beyond that, they're all good, they're all good leads. Even if they tell me they're working with another agent, for the most mm -hmm. part, I'm going to treat them just like I would a lead who's not working with an agent because I found some people say that to kind of keep you off their case. Other people. And what about opt-outs? Yeah, other people. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, who are selling a home, say in another state. So when they're asked, "Are you working with an agent?" They say yes, but if they're moving from out of state, they're not necessarily working with an agent here. They've just said yes because the question got asked, and they do have an agent in another state. Okay. Right. So I never presume. I just go about staying in touch with all of them as if, you know, they're going to respond. And I know as we talk on the phone, that it's not an easy thing to do mentally because, you know, you're sitting out there and you're touching people. Some open your communication, some don't, but they never call. And it's like, you know, it's like the lonely Maytag repairman, you know, and it's like, is anybody hearing me? Is anybody doing something? And yet out of the clear blue, suddenly someone will get in touch with you. So it's just important to understand probably no more than 10% of them will ever get in touch with you. So you just have to keep doing it because you don't know which 10% are going to come back at you. Awesome. So as a single agent, now let's dive in to your actual tasks and, and where you focus. Okay. when you respond to your new leads. So okay. um, let's take a look here. So this, and, and we had a pre-chat before the seminar, obviously, so we knew what we were talking about. But this, can you talk us through generally what your internet lead follow-up looks like when you generate your internet leads? Sure, sure. Um, first of all, I try and respond uh, as quickly as possible. Um, now, mind you, I'm not sitting there like this morning I had a lead and he signed up at 2 o'clock my time. Trust me, I'm not sitting there waiting for that lead to come in. He got responded to, you know, at 7 o'clock this morning, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but if I am not out with, with clients throughout a day and I'm closer to my desk and my computer, 
as new leads come in, I will respond to them as quickly as possible. The, the market leader system sends out uh, an immediate welcome letter, but I immediately go in and see what they were doing, what kind of houses they were looking at, and I send them my first uh, touch point, if you will, that sort of reintroduces me again, acknowledges that they may only, I understand they may only be quote unquote, just looking right now. Um, but right. here's some other homes they might consider. And are these what they're looking for? Or should I find them something different? I acknowledge that finding a home could be a complicated process. Um, but I, and I look at what they're looking at. Like, interestingly, last week I got a number of leads and I noticed several of them were only looking at, for the most part, one-story homes. So that alerts me when I send them that second you know, intro letter with a few listings to ask them, um, you know, I, or say something like, well, I noticed you were primarily looking at one-story homes. Is this a requirement? Or um, would a uh, two-story home with a master on the main floor be acceptable? OK. All right, so, so Nina, um, one thing that I'd love to do right now you're giving us such great information, but it's, okay. I'm sure it's hard for some of us to visualize it. So let's okay. dive into your account. Okay, go and ahead. you can walk us through a couple of leads if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Is that all right with you? Yeah. Okay, great. All okay. right. So here's Nina's account, and I'm sure a lot of us are more visual. So appreciate I know the information hard. now. Let's. Can you see it on your screen? <laughs> it hasn't come up on my screen yet. Okay. Let me see. Up oh, there it is. Great. Okay. Perfect. All right. Is that going to get larger? Um, if it's, lo you have to make your screen larger for it to get larger. Oh, okay. All right. Now, let me try this. View and okay. All right. Well, okay. So ignore those as we talked a minute ago. Ignore those that are marked new leads because they're actually personal. So I just have them there as reminders for myself. Okay, so Nina actually never has any new contacts sitting on her dashboard because you always stay on top of them, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the main time I would have a new con new contact sitting in my desk is when I get up in the morning and I see, you know, if some stuff came in overnight, and then I dispose of those as quickly as possible. Okay. Okay. So the first thing I do um, every morning when I sit down at my uh, dashboard here is I look to see what's come in since I closed down my computer the prior day. And I start responding to those uh, right away, okay? Because okay? part of what I'm trying to do is get in before that 12-hour limit that Market Leader puts on when they send out another automatic, what do you call it, the ICW, I think? Um, yep. Because I like to send them more personalized notes with listings that I've selected for them, okay? I then okay. kind of, once I've taken care of them, I go over to the right-hand side of my screen where it says Recent Contacts Online, and I look at who's been on over the last you know, 24 to 48 hours. And obviously, I'm more au courant on that than 48 hours, because on a day when I'm close to my computer, I'm kind of tracking it throughout the day, so that if someone comes on, um, who hasn't been on for a while, I can jump on them real quick and send them one of my, oh, welcome back letters. You know, great to see right. you back. You know, is there anything I can help you with, et cetera. Or if I see someone... Right. Now, you have, I just clicked on that recent contacts online link on your dashboard, and you have 45 contacts that showed up as being on your site in the last 48 hours. How in the word, or in the <laughs> world, do you drive that many people of your database back to your website over and over? Well, see, I find that to be an interesting question because I'm always like, but there must be like 700 people in that database, and how come more of them aren't on? Fundamentally, you know, the people who are getting listings get listings. I have people who are on various drip campaigns, and I have two basic drip campaigns, one of which is for people who get listing alerts, and one of which is for people who didn't sign up for listing alerts offering them listing alerts and giving them good Okay, reasons. so listing alerts are your key, right, to get them back? Sometimes. Like um, one okay. of the people who was on my account this morning that I looked at, um, she's really interesting in that, um, how should I put it, uh, she, she very rarely looks at her listings, 
but she reads everything I send her. Got it. As part of my drip. There are other people who only occasionally look at what I send them or never, but I can see them looking at their listings all the time. Okay? okay. So it's really there's not necessarily any rhyme or reason. That's part of the process of kind of sitting down every day and going through people. So the first two that you see, Dorothea Salzberg and uh -huh. Marcia Kellen, they were new leads in the last two days, and I've, I've sent them some things over the last couple of days. And before I came over for this webinar, I had done my follow-up touch uh, point for them today. So they obviously got it, and they've logged back on to see what I sent them. So, okay. so let me ask you this, Ina. Which Can we go into one of your contacts and show um, see some examples? For, yeah, go ahead. Go, go to Dorothea if you like. Okay. She's a fairly new lead, so there's not a ton okay. of stuff in there. All right. And then where would you like me to go from here? All right. Just You're going to you're gonna scroll down the page. Okay. All right. So well, first, before you even do that, just, okay, so you go to Dorothea. Now, um, so one of the first things I do with any lead when I log on, whether they're new, not so new, if they've logged on recently, I first check on the listing alerts button uh, at oh, the okay. top of the screen next to the summary button. Okay. And I look to see, it didn't go there yet. Taking all the load on your side? I know. Sorry about that. That's okay. I'm used to it. <laughs> okay, so you've got to be patient that. with the internet world. Oh, yeah, below that it says emailed listing alerts. So the first thing I uh -huh. do is I click on that emailed listing alerts. Oh, that's a cool area. Okay. All right. Because that shows me on any lead, you see, she's looked at everything that came to her in the last two days. Okay. Okay. Yep, I can see it in the open right here at the open section. That's right. right. Um, in the you know, so even if it's an older lead, sometimes they don't look for two or three weeks. Then I might send them a note that says, "Oh, hey, I noticed you haven't logged on for a while. Is it you know? Do you want me to you know uh, change your your search parameters a little bit, or something changed in your plans, or you know whatever? Anything to just kind of goose them a little bit, so to speak." So okay. Well, let's go take a look at those emails that you sent. Do you mind? Okay. Yeah, so go back to the summary page now. Okay, then I'm scrolling down to the emails, and I see your automated welcome email. Which one? The Dorothea touching base? The, uh, the, well, the, the first one um, is the automated one that the system sends out. Okay, so let's look at the second one then. Okay, so then if you go to, and then she asked for, so on, she signed up on the 3rd at 9.47 a.m., uh -huh. And I was out with the client, so about 45 minutes later, I sent her another note um, that now said, hey, thanks again for signing up. I realize, as you can see, I realize you may still be in the just looking stage. I attached a few um, listings to that email. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, and that's where I say, I know searching for homes is not an easy process, blah, blah, blah. Um, and at the end I say, and don't forget, here's my link where you can search for homes more. I try and add in that link all the time so they don't have to go look for it. I just kind of remind them, you can search here. Oh, great. So you always, as a, as a practice, put in a link to your website to the search page, to that buy tab, as so they can start to search. Much as I can. I mean, it doesn't fit in all emails, but I, I try and add in that little link to remind them, go here to search, okay? And as you can see, please click here to view the homes for sale. So I sent her a couple of homes, okay? okay. And so she opened that. Okay. Obviously. Now, if you go to the next letter, and obviously she opened okay. that because I think right after that letter, if I recall, she was logging in to get her password. <laughs> right, right. And then the next one is on the 5th. That's to this morning, and so since okay. I sent her, what time did that go out? That must have gone out um, yeah, about... This, one, this morning went at 11 o'clock Eastern yeah. time, your time. I so came over. So this Pacific. morning, see, she opened that. That was... You've been a busy bee this morning already, I can see. Oh my gosh, I took, I took <laughs> 25 of them before I came over, okay? So it says, <laughs> as you continue to search for property, she was looking at two specific zip codes, so I sent her the comparison out of Market Insider for that right. area. Okay. Okay. Um, and again, you see, don't forget, here's a link to search for more homes. Okay. 
Okay. Now, what I will do to now, obviously, since she's logged back in, and I'll see that tomorrow morning, it'll say to me, "Oh, she's been back in. Check her activity." Now I'll probably right. have a touch point with a few more listings. So I'm going to keep reeling her in, and after about okay. four or five. And days, how do you do that? Do you have How? a bunch of email templates that you have pre-written? Oh, then? go to, well, if you click on, yeah, emails. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it's not messy. You look at it and probably have a heart attack, but it means something to me. Oh, goodness. Everyone, yeah, look at this. Look how big this is, everyone. All right. Where's That's my awesome. message templates? OK. I now, have a, you told I me have a good earlier. There you go. Right. Now, and Nina, <laughs> sorry to, um, let, let me interrupt for just one quick second. We're getting a lot of questions in. And it would be an entirely other call, I think, if we went through your entire process <laughs> of follow-up for every single lead. I mean, we could probably do an hour of day with Nina for the next year with the amount of information you have to share. But in general, can you just tell us, are there coaching programs you've been subscribing to um, that other ones can, people can take advantage of as far as, like, lead follow-up? Um, no, I, well, I, 10 days of pain, where'd you learn that from? Is that from well, Million I think Dollar I learned Pipeline? that from Market Leader, and, you know, and I, I looked up the 10 days of pain program, and it just wasn't me. I, I'm a firm believer that on some level, you've got to come across as yourself and as genuine when this is your only form of contact with people. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the market leader 10 days of pain that some other agent had developed that worked for him is great, but it wasn't personalized enough for me. So I put the time in to do it. Now, clearly, I've been doing this for a long time. So I have been collecting letters. I have, you know, I have uh, been developing letters. Uh, I, I horse trade letters with other agents, and then I, and then I sort of refine them and edit them to be more in my voice, if you will. Okay, Got and it. I have a big, uh, broad base of different letters, so I can look at a lead and say, hmm, I think I'll send them this letter today, because in the marketing section, I have like 15 pages of letters. Right. Okay. So, um, but if you scroll down here, because this is all alphabetized, you will see that I have something called Touch One with Listings. So when I send them listings, it's real easy to go to the Touch One letter and just quickly edit it as I have to. Right. Um, there. Just, Perfect. Yeah, you just have to keep scrolling down. It, it'll hit, okay. the, it's in the T's. <laughs> yep, I, I found it. Touch One, Letter <laughs> with Listings. probably the leg showing up on everyone else's screen, but it's there. So, okay. well, thank you so much, Nina. And just so everyone knows, in the class notes that we are sending out to you after today's call and also loaded on the training and support portal, uh, we have a bunch of templates that Nina's given and, and shared with you all so you can use and be like her, a single agent. Steal from each other, borrow, and make them your own. Go to classes like with Jack, right, the Million Dollar Pipeline webinar, and yes. she's like, okay, I looked at all these emails, right, Nina, and I'm paraphrasing you. Yes. This wasn't me, but it was a good place to start to help you customize to make it your own. That's right. I, so I, I, I think that's a good takeaway. Yeah, the idea is to automate the process as much as possible so you can do this quickly. But automating does not mean that you take those letters and just send anything out. You have to right. send it. You still have to do some work. I'm sorry, it's really boring work, but you have to do it. And for those agents who are new, for those agents who are just starting out, literally you may have to, and that's what I did. I, every day I would set aside an hour and I would work on four or five letters. And then after a while, I have this whole library of letters, you know. So you, you never do it by saying, today, this afternoon, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to develop 40 letters. You'll never manage to do that. But if you do four a day for 10 days, all of a sudden you've got a campaign. All of a, You just have to label them so in your mind there's a logic when you go send something to somebody. Awesome. All right. So, um, so in general, when you're, when you're following up during the first month, you're really customized. Yes. <laughs> Can you talk through this slide, please? I'm going to lose my voice. Oh, sure. So the first month, of course, I'm like watching them like a hawk. I want to see who's logging back on. I want to see who's looking at listings. Uh, some of them don't, even though they've asked for listings. But I'm watching them because every day this forces me to make a deliberate decision about 
when to touch them, how to touch them, what to send them. After the first month to six weeks, depending on uh, what's happening, it's more of my standard drip, but I've always got most of them on a two to three week follow-up where I, it, it, in my notes there it says check status, meaning just check them out, you know. So every day I'm probably looking at 10 or 12 leads where it just says check status just to see what's happening with them, and that will generate or not some response for me that day, okay. And then throughout the month, I will be sending other information, a monthly newsletter. Um, you know, last month I sent out, because the weather was so bad, I sent out a mailing that said, um, you know, house hunting tips for any season. Um, you know, so I'm always looking for information to send to people uh, a couple of times a month that gives them just information about the market in general, about house hunting in general, or house selling. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a va more of a value added piece than anything else. Right. Interesting. Okay. Well, and I, that's one thing that really overwhelmed me with your follow-up strategies is just how in the world do you come up with all of these different touch points? So that's really helpful for us to all internalize the single agents and people that, you know, we don't have the ability to just outsource everything to somebody that's really creative to go create a newsletter for us, is to constantly be thinking with every single thing you receive from the industry, like what you can repurpose. Is that one of your strategies? Do you, are there any other things along that line that you can share with us? Yeah, it, it's an interesting mindset. Um, you know, when I first started blogging, um, it was very, very difficult because it was a new exercise for me. I can write very well. The issue was not could I write. The issue was what was I going to write about, okay? Um, once I started blogging, interestingly enough, I was going through life and things were suddenly in my face. Oh, you should write about that tomorrow. It's like you open yourself up. And it's kind of the same thing with what you want to send to your uh, internet lead database. Um, I, I subscribe to the Keeping Current Matters uh, blog and information. And there right, we lost you, Nina. Are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Nina? Can you hear me? Hold on, everyone. We're going to work to try to get Nina back. Not sure okay. what just happened. I'm all right, because I can hear you. Hello, Nina? Yes, can you hear me? Hello? Oh, then it's me that lost her. Sorry, everyone. I'll, I'll try to call back on a different line. Yeah, because I could hear you. Oh, um, now I can hear you again. Weird. Okay. Sorry, so, everyone. <laughs> hey. I just lost her. All right. So KCM sends me something every day. I will extrapolate a quick note to people out of something from KCM. It's really, once you start thinking that way, you will see opportunities to extrapolate information and send somebody a message. What's KCM? What's that stand uh, for? Keeping Current Matters. They have a great okay. blog, and I believe the blog is free. You can subscribe to their blog, keepingcurrentmatters.com. Um, you can also subscribe, and it's fairly inexpensive. I want to say it's about $25 a month. It's not very expensive. But I get all sorts of slides and information from them in many formats that I can then incorporate into my buyer and seller presentations that I, can, that I have a license to use on my blog or on you know, my Facebook page or where, where have you. And so they're always kind of giving you the latest and greatest of information about uh, what's happening in the real estate world. Like today, they sent out something, uh, a one-page item on why you shouldn't try and sell your home yourself, why, mm -hmm. why you shouldn't be a FISBO. Okay, well I can extrapolate that stuff and send a note out. I can extrapolate that stuff and have it in my files in case I'm ever talking to somebody who's thinking about being a FISBO. So as I said, the interesting thing is that when you start kind of opening your, your thought process to needing information like this, it actually presents itself. You just weren't looking for it before, but when you're, when you're there thinking about it, it's there in front of all of us all day long, okay? Our lenders send out an interesting information. Um, a lot of my inspectors send out interesting information. I'm on all their mailing lists. So, um, yeah, it, it, it puts a lot of stuff into my email box, but it's usually valuable stuff, and I find right. 
and I do look at this stuff because you just never know when there's a hidden gem that you want to communicate out to your database. Right. So just to recap for everyone, there's a lot of questions everyone's chatting in about, and they're like, what was the name of that site? It was KCM, Keeping Current Matters. Is Keeping the blog Current that Yes, and they right, have a monthly webinar as well. Okay, great. And she also, just when she receives things from different inspectors and people within the industry, she you're always thinking about how to repurpose that content. Now, yes. Nina, next question I have for you, and this is something I thought was really helpful. As a single agent, how important is continuing education? Has that been for you? Well, of course, how would you advise other people? I think it's important for anybody. Um, the rate at which stuff in our business is changing these days is mind-boggling. In other words, it, I think stuff changed in the last five years at a greater pace than it had for the 10 years before that, and the last 10 years way greater than the 10 years before that. The pace of change is very quick, okay? So I... So I how do you build that into your day, I guess? Well, I, let me put this way. Like right now, um, I go to every million dollar pipeline uh, webinar that I can live. That's on Monday morning. So I just fill that into my schedule up front, and I schedule around it. Right. I try and schedule as much around the power hours, I think Wednesdays, as much as I can. When I get my KCM webinars, I schedule that in. So really, I consider those things appointments with myself. I, it's very easy to kind of go, oh, yeah, if I have time, I'll go. I take a different approach to it. I put it into my calendar. And to me, it's like an appointment with a client, except I'm my own client. All right, so listen, my, my point on the day is I'm a morning person. So I am always, by, you know, by 6 in the morning, I've already put in an hour at the gym. If you're not a morning person, you may have to reverse your day to some degree. But the point is that you have to do it, OK? So when I sit down at my computer at 6.30 to 10.30 in the morning, I try not to take phone calls. And what I'm doing is I'm doing my blog. I'm going through my leads on active rain. I'm checking expires. I'm doing whatever social media checks on that. Um, I check my top producer account in case I've got clients who need to get a birthday card, an anniversary card, etc. Um, right. Obviously, from 12 to 2, 11 to 1, it just really depends on when these webinars are scheduled. At least two to three times a week, I'm on a webinar. Um, and then, you know, and in fact, I try very hard never to even schedule a closing before 10 a.m. so I can get all this stuff done. And then I do clients in the afternoon. Now, clearly, there are days when I can't push clients off to the afternoon, so I flip my day around a little bit. You, you have to have some flexibility. But I think the right. key is to keeping it, knowing what you have to do, and just doing it every day. OK, speaking of knowing what you have to do, okay. there's a question. Can you possibly be a single agent and do everything yourself? Not or are there times that you really need to outsource? Oh, yeah, only if you never sleep, okay? So you do know. <laughs> so I think on one level, you have to know what you're good at. Like, I'm a terrible photographer. Is it worth it to me per listing to pay a, a great professional photographer $100 to photograph my listings and upload those for me? Absolutely. Um, I don't know about how closings are for other people, but once I put a property in contract, there is not a single transaction that doesn't require at least another 10 to 15 hours worth of work to get it to the closing table. Well, is it worth it to me to pay a closing coordinator $350 for a transaction to do, to do that work? Absolutely, because that's 10 to 15 hours left over for prospecting and client work. My husband keeps my books. You know, if you don't have a husband who can do that, get yourself, you know, a bookkeeper to do that. Um, my husband has a license. He doesn't sell, but he has access to houses with a lockbox. He will do things like put signs in the ground for me, put, you know, uh, stamp envelopes, seal envelopes. I mean, you have to start thinking creatively to take those 10 15 20 $25 an hour jobs out of your hands so you can do the stuff that brings you the big bucks. Awesome. So one thing I know you really value, well, not value, that's, it's a big focus of your business because it feeds you, right? 70% of your business is from referrals. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I just wanted everyone to know 
we are putting a snapshot in the class notes and the her day, her daily kind of activities in the yeah. class handout. Both of these will be in there as well as some of your sample emails. Um, okay. And this is your referral marketing plan. So can you just give us a quick 30 seconds high level, what are we looking at here? <laughs> yeah, I I try and touch all of my, just for, you know, even though I don't think of them as past clients, but anyone who's been a client, anyone who's a current client, anyone who's a uh, prospect, at least once a month by snail mail, at least once a month by email. Um, so I am sending them information throughout the year. I'll send them personal notes. I'll send them, you know, cards. But I'm always, always touching them and I'm always looking for another way to touch that database and as you can see on, on this chart there's hardly a month that goes by that I haven't touched at least 150 people to some degree um, you know uh, I mean this is so ingrained in my brain and I've been doing it for so long it's sort of like oh February comes like today this morning I put in the mail uh, my little Valentine's Day uh, magnetic uh, pads with my card on it that says, I love oh, to yes. sell to you. Okay. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, Mother's Day cards, Father's Day cards, uh, magnetic pads for Fourth of July with, with a flag theme. You know, just get creative and think about it. And these are not expensive things to do. You can do it relatively inexpensively, but you're always touching them. And before the question gets asked, let me say this. I have never had anybody call me up or run into me on a street in Charlotte or at the grocery store and say, Nina, you're in touch too much. Stop it. Okay? They usually, <laughs> what they're normally saying is, thank you so much. A lot of agents right. are afraid that you're, you're in touch too much. There's no such thing. Obviously, if you call them every day, that's a little bit too much. That gets okay? annoying. Right. But um, <laughs> you're, at that point, you're stalking them. But if you're right. thinking hard about what gives, what is valuable information, they will never tell you to stop being in touch with them. Or helpful things like the notepads. Those are just always handy to have on hand. Oh, you know, what, what would be? Well, well, um, well last <laughs> month I, I sent out market analyses of sales activity in, in 150 different clients' neighborhoods in, in terms of what got sold there the prior year, what was currently active, et cetera. Doesn't everybody want to know what's happening in their community? I'll give them a half-year review come July for you know January through June. Um, if I get my hands on interesting information, I might send them a link to it in terms of a recap of the market. So you just need to be thinking about, you know, again, opportunities present themselves all the time. You know, right. Halloween safety tips, you know. Um, I personally, I don't send out uh, Christmas cards to my client database. I send them a calendar, but I do send them a Thanksgiving postcard that thanks them for doing business with me. Nina, and can I just say, and I'm, I think I'm speaking for a lot of people here, this sounds like a lot of work. What well, do you say to, to everyone that is like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I could do this. This sounds like this sounds like a um, lot of work. All right. So anybody who knows me knows I have a few little guilty pleasures. Okay. One of my little guilty pleasures is I've been watching General Hospital for 50 years. I saw the first show back in 63. Okay. I record it. I sit on my bed and I stuff envelopes. I put stamps on postcards, <laughs> okay. There, there are ways of building that into your schedule. When I go on, like, I use up all my Valentine's Day pads, but four of them this year. Uh, so later this week, I'll go to whatever, houseofmagnets.com. I will order a two-year supply. So they're sitting there waiting for me. You know, there's ways of just doing it, but once you start doing it, it's just part of kind of the daily process and you just know it's there you do it it's, it's really funny you can there's a lot of things you can do it seems like it's a lot of work but once it's just part of your normal schedule it's not really interfering it's just part of what the job is about all right so we're going to take away three tips that you want us all to have just imprinted in our minds from today's call <laughs> what would be your top three tips for the single agent nina all right, go to number one because I don't remember what order we discussed these. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, number one, the discipline of consistency. You, you just have to go do it. Is it Nike that says do it or some version of it? Yeah, just do it. <laughs> just do it. You have to get 
disciplined. You can't go, sit there in the day and say, oh, I've got to follow up on leads today. Follow up on those leads between 8 and 9, and that will get done. As we already talked about, I don't think there's such a thing as a bad lead. So trust me, I don't quit on a lead until they buy or die. All right. Now, they may unsubscribe, and that's fine. But if they don't unsubscribe until they buy or they die, that's my philosophy. And again, it, it, once that's in your brain, you just do it. <laughs> Love it. Uh, All right. Last, and and number I, three? I remember number three because I think that's this a is really your favorite. That's, a, that's one of my favorites because I'm a little bit of a control freak, if you haven't noticed, okay? Um, and those of us who are sort of perfectionists, we have to strive not for perfection but for excellence. And for the control freaks, we want to control everything. And the one thing I learned, because I've been coached by the Brian Buffini group for years, is I can't control results much as I'd like to. The only thing I can control is what I do. And that goes back to item number one of the discipline of consistency. And item number two, which is don't give up. All you can do is know what you have to do, put one foot in front of the other every single day and do it. And if you control what you do and you're disciplined in doing it, the results will follow. Stop trying to control the results. Just control what it is you do. Awesome, Nina. Thank you so much for just giving That's us right. so much inspiration and so many wonderful tips and how you're successful so that we can replicate that for ourselves and our business. So that leaves me um, to ask the audience, what now? What is it that you can do starting this moment to move, put one foot in front of the other, just like Nina says, and starting to like, just do it? So here are some homework activities. And we say that homework like is in a, a yeah, you're going to get it done this time. Okay, it's things you really need to implement into your business to grow your business. Number one, add time that you dedicate to your self-education into your weekly schedule. Number two, create at least one new touch point for your market leader database, your prospecting database. Create at least one new touch point for your referral database. We'll just start small, and then implement a strategy to keep up with your, and we're not, I shouldn't use the word past client, but the current clients and your referral base, okay, because everyone is a client, right, Nina? Yes, and you can use my annual schedule to, you know, to kind of give you ideas. I mean, for me, because I've been doing it for so long, it's just there. If you're starting out now in, uh, you know, February, it's maybe a little late to do something for Valentine's Day, start with March and then do right. something in April. You don't have to do the whole year this week. Figure out what you might want to do in March and just start working towards it. And every month you're going to add a little bit of something. Great. Great. One bite at a time. I love it. All right. right. So now for next week, next week we have an exciting class. Ali's going to be presenting on how to manage your leads from other sources. So basically how to take all your leads from your third-party leads, anybody you import, and maximize your conversion. We have some new features that we're rolling out this week into your market leader system that you'll learn all about next week. So come to that class. Okay. Same time, same place, every Wednesday at 10 o'clock Pacific, 1 o'clock Eastern, and you can sign up on, forget the www part, just the learn.marketleader.com. That's our new training and support portal. And the class handout that we've been referencing today, you can download it there, or I'll be emailing it out with some class notes after today's call, if you do us the favor of filling out the survey, I'll take, I'll return the favor by emailing you personally those class notes. So please do fill out that survey. It'll show up when you exit the webinar. And I know we're all dying to ask Nina questions. We can't, can't possibly get to them all before the end of the call, but we'll do our best to ask some of the most, the biggest FAQs. So Nina, are you ready? Yes. Okay. I'm here. So, all right. Let's see here. Are there specific vendors you use for your calendars, cards, et cetera? 
Um, <laughs> well, really what I look for, because you know, once you order from one, you get on an email address for everyone. I look for the cheapest rate possible. I look for whoever's got something on sale. So usually there's someone in July who sends out something where the calendar will cost me about 15 cents a piece instead of 35 cents a piece. So I just watch what comes through my through my email address. And if you go to something like House of Magnets and what have you, get on their mailing list. They will always be sending you their specials. Right. And then, um, oh, you know, we have a popular question. What's Nina's full name? It's Hollander, everyone. H-O-L-L-A-N-D-E-R. And we can type, the, our, my catters will type that in for you all so you can Google her and she'll come up on a lot of active rain posts, I'm sure. Um, so one thing, um, oh, when you were trying to call back in, I told everyone that you worked buyers and sellers 50-50, roughly. How many right. active listings do you keep at all times, they want to know, and how many buyers are you working with every month, roughly? Um, as far as active clients? That's, that's a little harder to say. Um, like right now, I had, last week I had three active listings because one had to withdraw temporarily because their child got very sick. Um, by the, I put one on last Monday. By Friday it was in contract. You know, so, uh, you know, sometimes I have, uh, you know, six to eight. I rarely have more than eight to ten listings because of the way I handle my listings with very personalized service, I just can't do it. I'm not an assembly line. So um, right. I, I will handle fewer clients through the year. They're usually higher price points, um, you know, so, uh, but I'm not, it's, you know, but if I take a listing, 99% of the time I will sell it. It's not like take on a bunch of listings, half sell, half don't, next. With me, if I right. take them, I'm going to sell them. Okay, so I'm sure there's um, a whole strategy and a whole call in and of that that <laughs> we can yeah. probably dive into another time. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, Nina. Um, how do you? Oh, this is a great single agent question. How do you ever go on vacation and take care of your leads? Oh, I do. Okay, so really, I have family. I have sisters in Russia. I go every year at the end of August for two weeks to Russia. That's nine hours away. Out of those two weeks, I am on planes for two days of that time because it's like 24 hours door-to-door -door trip. So first right. of all, you know, my my phone for email works when I hit the ground in Munich waiting to collect, connect planes. Um, interestingly enough, so the first thing I do, and this is a great hint, early in August, I start contacting every client I have that's active whether it's a listing or a buyer, every prospect who's about who's kind of really percolating there, and I start okay. calling and or emailing them and reminding them that I am going to be out of the country for two weeks as of a certain date. And, you know, if there's an emergency, here's what they do. Otherwise, you know, I'll touch base with them when I'm back in mid-September. I've never had anything fall apart as a result. With Market Leader the way it is, with Top Producer, all of that being, you know, internet based, I can be on the other end of the world and take an hour every day and see what's happening and quick respond, quick respond, quick respond, you know, once a day. And it doesn't really interfere with my ability to take a break. Awesome. The one thing I haven't asked you yet, I thought I had, but I guess I hadn't because a lot of people are asking you, Nina, and okay. I think this might be the last question we have time for today is where do you get your, your internet leads, where do you get your leads from in general? Can you just well, briefly explain? I, the majority of them now I get through market leads, okay? I get a certain, okay. my, a certain amount uh, through my website. Um, I get a certain number of leads through my Lead Street account as a uh, Remax agent. Um, you know, so those are the internet leads. Obviously, all of you know, I do a certain amount of expired marketing. I do a certain amount of, uh, uh, you know, I have other, you know, you'll get the occasional truly a lead or something like that as well. So, um, you know, but the majority of them now come through Market Leader. It's hard to manage too many sources of leads. Right. So you keep it simple. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, and and everyone not, is like, and you're paying for them, correct? And you're yes, talking paid it, leads? Yeah. 
Yeah, let's, that's right. Let's go back. Let's go back to what we're, this what started this. I'm a single agent. I am not running a team where I have to feed two, three, four, five, six buyer agents with leads all the time. So I'm not sitting on Craigslist trying to generate 300 leads in a month because I couldn't possibly handle it. Okay, um, so it's much more of a you know. I have found I'm better off having fewer but really working them hard because they'll convert. Nice. And I think that's something a lot of us can, that's something we can, we can wrap our teeth around, <laughs> yeah. you know, wrap our yeah. minds around is, you know, how do I, you know, do I go into this like lead generation cycle or I'm just trying to, you know, gun out as many as I can, but then I don't have time to follow up. So you found that just focusing your energies on a few really fantastic tactics and really taking care of the leads that you do get uh, have, have generated you a lot of results. Yes, correct? and it makes Did I summarize yes. that right? That's correct. And it makes no sense to rush out there and start generating leads however you do it if you don't have a system in place to deal with them when they start coming in. So really, you need to have some kind of a process ready to go. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time and your money. Awesome. Well, Nina, I just, and I think I speak for everyone on the call, a lot of people have been just been so thankful, so appreciative of you taking time out of your busy single agent life to basically give back to the rest of, you know, our entire market leader community, real estate community, sharing your email templates, sharing all your words of wisdom. Everyone's just is like, this is so awesome. Thank you so much, Nina, from the bottom of our hearts for being here today. It's my pleasure. I'm, I'm a, I, I've always said I, I have no secrets. Ask me anything. I'll give you an answer for it. You may not like my answer, but um, you know uh, we have to share with each other and help each other. We're not competitors. We're all colleagues at the end of the day. Love it. Well, we, we thank you and we appreciate you. Have a wonderful rest of your day, Nina. And you everyone too. else, have a wonderful, productive, fantastic day yourselves. And I'm going to be a little selfish here, Nina, and I'm going to say, go Hawks! <laughs> <laughs> we did it. Okay, sorry. Yes, We're from Seattle. I, just, I have to put that out there. Everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you, Nina. And look for those class notes. Please fill out the survey. Tell us how, uh, what you thought and how we can make this better for you. Looking forward okay. to seeing everyone, everyone on our call next week. All right. See you then. Bye. <laughs> see you, Nina. Thank you. Bye.